Okay, so let's get started because we don't have a lot of time, um, especially, especially after the try runs we have, we have done. So, welcome everybody to this afternoon this day of the OpenStack uh, Summit. Uh, we are myself actually, I think I have problems with the mic. Yeah, even myself will uh, give you some insight in Amadeus's travel with, with the, on the OpenStack journey. Uh, if you have more than three or four slides, then it's always good to have an agenda. So we start with a, with a short introduction uh, so that you know who is talking to you and also uh, what is the business of Amadeus, where are we coming from, because this is also important for, uh, for the later slides. Um, then actually I will give some insights why we actually did look at OpenStack, why we actually have selected OpenStack as a technology to be used. And then most of the presentation actually we will spend on our journey, what, what, what was the challenges we were facing, and also later on then Eve will give some technical uh, details on the actual setup we are using at the moment, and then we wrap up with a one-slide one slide summary. So while they're still getting prepared, I start with myself. So my name is Udo Seidler, and originally I'm a teacher for mathematics and physics, and I spent some additional years at the university. And back then, actually, I got uh, infected by the Linux and the, the open source virus, and luckily, uh, I never recovered from, from that one. And before I joined Amadeus more, uh, almost 10 years ago, I was working in different uh, areas as a consultant, as a trainer, and spent some additional years also at uh, HPC uh, environment, supporting uh, big compute clusters for ger uh, German car manufacturers like uh, Audi or BMW. And inside Amadeus, I also have I had different roles and responsibilities, and since our last reorganization, I belong to this uh, CTO office, which we internally call the Infrastructure and Architectural Governance Unit. And with that one, I hand over to Eve to introduce himself. So, yeah. Good. You may actually ask yourself why Amadeus and VMware are sharing the stage at the OpenStack Summit. And on the first part, why VMware and, um, and actually, for some reason, I get to this one later. Uh, so maybe I introduce Amadeus a little bit first. Um, so normally I did ask always, okay, who knows Amadeus? And we had just a, uh, a chat uh, in front of the room about that one. So for the people coming from the US, if you have heard about WorldSpan or Sabre, then Amadeus is kind of the European counterpart of it. If you're coming from China or Asia, no travel sky, Amadeus is kind of the European counterpart. And actually compared to OpenStack, we are quite an um, old company. Uh, Amadeus was founded by European airlines in the late 80s. And according to those founder airlines, we actually have distributed our main functions. So we have our headquarter in Madrid in Spain because um, Air Iberia was involved. The main development site is uh, in Sofia Antipolis, close to Nice in France because the uh, French Air France was involved. And the data center, so the heart of the uh, service we do provide is in Germany because the German Lufthansa was part of the game as well. And this is actually where I work. So our main data center is located close to, uh, close to Munich. Now we started like the Sabres and the Travel Skies as a classical uh, global distribution service provider, computer reservations for travels by, by air. But since then we have evolved a lot. And if you look at the picture, you, you can see that we cover many aspects of traveling today. So it's not limited to uh, traveling by airplane, also by cars, if it's a rental car, uh, booking hotels, uh, going by ship, uh, even up to the extent to uh, tra um, travel insurances. And also getting closer then to, to the airport. So for some airports and uh, airlines, we do provide so-called departure control services, which actually makes sure that you can actually get your porting pass, that you actually get the tax for, for your luggage. Uh, and for us, actually, this was a big game changer when we went into this business. And we went even further, now providing as well scheduling of the runways for some pilot airports there, there as well. So since we started in the late 80s, uh, we have changed a lot. We gained a lot of more, more business, uh, and we have been quite successful. We are not the first one in the market, but we are now, moved, or since quite some time, we are leader in the market. Now, as I mentioned, our main data center is in Central Europe, uh, close to Munich. Uh, we do have operational sites uh, across the world. The main sites are 
on the East Coast in the US and in Australia to provide a kind of uh, follow the sun principle to cover global operations. But we also have people uh, ramming up in Bangalore, in London, somewhere else in, in Germany and in other areas as well. And now I get to the point which I by accident wanted to get on earlier, why VMware and Amadeus, who are coming from totally different businesses, are actually teaming up here at the OpenStack Summit. And yeah, while the story is quite easy, uh, we have a relationship with VMware, or VMware has a relationship with us for, for many, many years. So we started quite early with uh, compute virtualization uh, with some GSX servers and having running Windows guests on them just to better utilize the capacity. And since then, as you can see on, on the second part of the slide, the world has changed a lot on our side. So we're talking about 1,000 plus uh, uh, ESX hosts uh, today, 6,000 plus guests running, and both numbers are actually growing to the natural growth, uh, to the migrations uh, from, micro, uh, from mainframe to the distributed world, and also, also new business. And because of this long-lasting and healthy relationship, we actually came to a commercial agreement which is a kind of all-you-can-eat uh, contract for us, which makes it much easier for us to, as uh, Amadeus, to use VMware products. So some of them are mentioned here for software-defined compute, for software-defined networking, and for software-defined storage. And of course, yeah, for software-defined infrastructure, so VMware integrated OpenStack, which is the di distribution we do use uh, for our uh, installations, which we'll cover on later on. So as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, world leader in, in the travel industry, uh, and we have been successful for many years. We are still successful. We are still successful. So the question is, uh, why should we change things? Never change uh, a winning system. So why should we look at things like cloud type things, infrastructure as a service? Now the truth is quite quite easy, and I skip over this slide to to save some time. Uh, our customers have changed as well, sometimes because they wanted to change, but also sometimes because they needed to change, because the customers of our customers have changed. The entire IT world has changed. So uh, if you really look into crystal ball and if you look what's going on there, what other, other companies are facing, uh, we still can continue to do the traditional business with our traditional customers, uh, but there are new customers we want to attract. There are new business lines we want to explore. In order to do so, we need to change things. Um, and then looking what other companies are doing, facing the same uh, challenges or coming from the same background, then looking at infrastructure as a service seemed to uh, be a quite a good thing for us. And if we boil this down a little bit to what we need actually is, so our workloads, which, which traditionally were served out of the data center in uh, Central Europe, so inside our own walls, behind our fences, we need to make this work those workloads movable and even more uh, clonable or replicatable to, to a lar large extent. Being movable with, within our premises, so maybe from the main, main data center to the disaster recovery site, but also going outside our premises, off-premise, maybe to a hosted cloud or even to, to a public cloud. Uh, and by doing this, uh, we didn't want to give up on the freedom uh, selecting actually the hardware we need to run this. Uh, keep in mind, we still have a large data center and we will have this for quite some time. So we don't want to give up or we don't want to introduce uh, an artificial login to buy a particular hardware or to buy a particular software if you want to join uh, the OpenStack as um, the OpenStack train. Now, OpenStack, yes, it does provide infrastructure as a service, but there is a big difference. Uh, it's, it is open source. So now looking at open source technology is not really new for Amadeus. And actually, even before Linux was born, uh, internally, uh, the applications we have developed, the source code was available to everybody inside, inside Amadeus. We did have kind of this open source mindset already many, many years ago. And we are not early adapters, but we are not late adapters either of Linux and other open source technologies like Apache or, or Shaper. So we are quite used to uh, how to interact with a particular community, how does it work when you have uh, community versions and enterprise versions. And the second aspect which we are looking for were um, APIs and, and standardized APIs. Um, and such kind of things are also not new to us either. Because the, the market we are in, the industry we are in, uh, we have to work with competition. We have to work with so many different customers. So standardized ABIs was something we were used to anyway. So this is something which is not new to us, but actually is a requirement what, what we want to have. Now getting back to the question, OpenStack, why? Well, I would counter the question, why not? Uh, and I think in these days, there are not many options left. If you want to have uh, a cloud type or infrastructure as a service implementation, 
on-site, so in on-premise, and if you want to have open source. A few years ago, I think this question might be more uh, applicable, but in these days, there's not much left. And the second point I want to make is uh, that when you want to go this way, or when you want to select a particular product, uh, please make sure that you, do, that you not stick only to the technical aspects of it. And I will uh, touch on, on, on that one uh, for most of the parts of my slides uh, during the presentation. There's a huge non-technical aspect, or even at least a semi-technical aspect of uh, p choosing a solution as well. And actually this one I have seen quite often will uh, determine if your project, if your journey is successful uh, or not. Another point which was important for us by selecting OpenStack as the technology for infrastructure as a service was that, okay, we have to think beyond. If you have infrastructure as a service, th that's good. That's cool for the infrastructure team because then it's easy for them. But it doesn't provide any business. It's not good enough for us because we provide really applications or even services on top of that one. So what we need is, first of all, an easy way to integrate existing platforms, existing applications as well, but also a possibility maybe to uh, explore new paths on the, uh, on the platform layer or on the software layer. So kind of doing uh, two, two things uh, with one set of software like application packaging, and here I think about uh, Linux containers or going even one, one level up. And of course, integration and interfacing with the existing environment, because we cannot simply throw away the data center. We cannot simply uh, uh, build a new one some, somewhere else and start from scratch there. We still have to do a traditional business to serve our traditional customers, and we have the new stuff on, on, on top, and it would be good if we can integrate this as much as possible. So the overall journey, I think there are four phases of it um, before you start, and this is what we, what we did as well. Uh, take a deep breath, uh, sit down, and really f uh, think through the situation. Where are you coming from? What's the current situation? But also, where do you want to go? And then based on that, make sure that you get the right start to it, because later on, it's much more complicated to fix your, your path or your travel uh, when you have screwed up at the start. And while you're traveling, uh, make sure that you stay focused, that you, all, that you don't lose the momentum, uh, that you attract as much as possible uh, to support you on, on, on your journey. And as I said already, uh, don't lose the focus. Uh, always keep in mind where do you want to go and what's your ultimate goal on that one. Now, for the moment, we uh, remove two of the three main parts of infrastructure as a service or infrastructure. So we forget about storage, we forget about uh, network, we just look at compute. And the quotes here not so long time ago, you would have heard uh, inside Amadeus. And this will give you an idea how complicated already wa it was uh, to introduce software-defined compute uh, uh, virtualization in our data center. So this makes clear, okay, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, non-technical work to be done, if you really want to be successful only on the STC part, but also then uh, on the software-defined infrastructure part. Um, maybe to add to that, um, especially can you go back? Um, especially if it comes to uh, hardware selection for a specific workload, um, you will see later in the slides that's something we try to address um, by trying to schedule certain workloads on certain hardware types. And I guess that's what you need to do in enterprises to bridge the gap or bridge bridge from like the hardware sorts to the virtualization sorts. So kind of like in a compromise way uh, to say, okay, you are going to run on this hardware that has the characteristics that you um, used for years and you trust for years. Yeah. Yeah, good point, good point. Thanks, Eve. So, some of the things listed here we did on purpose because we know we had to do this. Some of them we did more or less by, by accident, but later on with hindsight it turned out this was something, something good. So we did actually sit down and looked around, okay, where are we coming from? What is the existing environment? Also, what is the existing mindset of the people going back to the quotes on, on, on the previous slide? So it became quite clear, and I had just a chat with somebody else uh, who is facing similar challenges, uh, the why. Why are you doing this? This is important. It's not good enough if this is just something for the infrastructure unit or for a particular department or division in your organization. Actually, uh, it goes to the extent that uh, you have to show it will add business value. It will help your company to uh, be successful, even more successful uh, in the future. And this will also help later on to get the, uh, the power or the uh, the support from the, from the senior management or even from, from the C-level management, which you will need, especially for, for the latest point, which says secure the resources. If you can, and this is not easy, especially if you are coming from an a, a IT landscape, which is large and which is already running in production, try to fence out 
bits and pieces that you can start as small as possible, and this helps a lot. Uh, it may not look cool at the beginning if you start with just two or three nodes, not with 500 or 5,000, but it makes it much more easier to identify, okay, what are the dependencies? Who are the key people which I do need? Who are, which are the processes which uh, have to change, which have to be adapted? Uh, but also work around blocking stones which you, which you may face. And you can extend later on. So you have separated your scalability problems or challenges from the, uh, let's say, mindset or non-technical problems. As mentioned already, identify the key people. Um, and it's not only inside the infrastructure unit. And, and so this is the same on our side. So they, they are the core, but you need also the people in the line organization. They are your champions to, to spread the word, to support you. And as I said, at the end, you have to provide a service. You have to provide a business. And unless infrastructure is your business, uh, you need the layers on top as well, and you need support by those people on, on top as well. Ideally, you create win-win uh, situations, and this should be a no-brainer. If you cannot easily come up with, those, with such situations, I think there's something wrong uh, anyway uh, on that one. Yeah, I did uh, list some quotes uh, related to compute uh, virtualization, and actually this is the angle where we are coming from. So we have a quite a huge uh, compute virtualization environment, we have some highly skilled people there, we also got started educating the people, preaching them, no, it's not bad, and hypervisors are secure as well, and, and things like that. So those, this was, was the angle where we were coming from. So we started from, from that part of the, uh, of the infrastructure, not from the network part and not from the, not from the storage part. Yeah, and then it happened, a customer came along, a new customer with some, let's say, interesting uh, requirements, and we could have sat down saying, okay, let's see how we can build this, uh, this service, provide this service uh, with the existing modules. It was clear we had to change bits and pieces, but actually we took the decision, okay, this is good, this is exactly our pilot, uh, where we start from scratch, where we build a new stack based on OpenStack, which will be our future stack, and we started really greenfield with, with, with that one. We did select the right people which we needed there, based on the experience, based on the mindset, and based on other soft skills. And it was not that we said, okay, this particular team or this particular team, so we didn't care about the line organization. Actually, we picked the people we need, we picked the experts, and we pulled them together, not, re not to virtual teams, to, to real teams. So there were rooms provided for them, and they were sitting there and, and, and working there. And of course, in order to do so, you need resources. Uh, and luckily, on our side, this was an initiative which was fully supported by the, by the highest management level you can get inside Amadeus. Uh, so they did uh, take care that they actually get the rooms, that they get the, get the equipment, that they get pulled out of their uh, current assignments, that they actually can concentrate uh, on that one. And then this is something Amadeus specific. In the past, we are used to the habit, do it your own. Nobody else can do it better than us. Um, but actually here, we, we changed this also a lot. So we teamed up with quite a few companies, VMware being one of them, uh, because we were quite new in the OpenStack business. So it is really wise to look, okay, who has much more experience, uh, either as a provider or as a, as a customer uh, or some, something else. So we did team up also with other companies uh, where we had relationships, also healthy relationships like, like Red Hat or, or Mirantis. So based on that, there was quite a bit of known stuff. We, we knew the VMware part, and we knew, okay, this is the way we want to go. But there was a lot of new stuff, and a lot of unknown stuff as, as well. Um, and here, uh, my advice is don't be afraid if things change out of the sudden, if you didn't plan it that way. That's, that's okay. That's, that's part of the, of the adventure. So one of the new things we needed was new mindset. Um, and this goes a little bit back to the quotes you have seen on, on the previous slide. So we needed people who really think differently, who don't think, okay, I have done my work now for 20 years exactly the same way, and it was successful, it is still successful, why should I change it? Uh, you need people really with a different mindset, uh, uh, also different mindset regarding how we approach failures. And that idea is because our business is so critical, uh, we are quite afraid of failures, something fails that it can impact our customers. But however, with OpenStack or going this way, you have to change this a little bit. You have actually to embrace failures and, and think, okay, failures will always happen. And you have to be confident uh, by experience or by the skills of the people that you can handle that one. And then you can decide if you want to handle availability on the infrastructure level, on the platform level, on the software level, or on both, or a mixture of, of all of them. And also, 
change the way how, how you work. So at our site, we are used to maintenance windows of a few minutes within three months or six months. So our approach for change is always was to pull them up, to stack them up, have a big change, and then we, then we throw it in. And we can manage that one, but it doesn't work with, with OpenStack. If you have a release cycle of six months for OpenStack release, you cannot pull up the changes for six months uh, uh, to do so. And of course, and for the sake of the password, I, uh, I will mention uh, DevOps. As I said earlier, so the main development site was uh, and still is in, in France, and the data center where Globe Operations is working is, is in Germany. So even geographical, we were quite, quite separated. But it doesn't work that way. End-to-end -end responsibility means uh, that also the developer understands if I do this particular change, this could be the impact to, to the customer or just the impact to my colleague who actually has to run the code. Or maybe I experience this much better if I run the code, my, uh, run the code myself. Being in the business for so many years, and we still have mainframe, uh, to, to give you an insight here, uh, we have a lot of platform, so-called platform one or platform two applications. Uh, if you can avoid, don't try to migrate them to put them on, on, on the new stack. Uh, you may get it working, but it's much more challengeable, it's much more complicated, and uh, it doesn't make the things, the things easier. So we took the decision, okay, in order to do so, we start from scratch. We rewrite the application. Uh, we don't want to use the existing application and make it kind of working. Now we really do some development work and, and start from scratch. Of course, it's not that black and white. You cannot, out of the sudden, do the same business uh, with a total new application. So at some areas, uh, we actually had to step back and to say, okay, this one, we would like to have, to have it this way, but actually, we, we cannot be fully stateless. We have to cover state to a certain extent, and we have to make some, some commitments there, sometimes to cut corners, sometimes to do workarounds, to do things which you would not like to do, but we have to do it in order to, to progress. But there's also something good with that one, because we have now this 2.5 or 2.8 platform applications, and they're actually a good bridge between the traditional business and, and the new business. So we didn't go from zero to 100 in one step. It needs a little bit more steps, but it's okay, because it gives us also more time, uh, more time to learn. And last but not least, and at least here, you need support from the upper management level. So our old organization, uh, we had a lot of silos, so there was application management, and actually there were several application management units, and even inside infrastructure, in, inside the infrastructure area, we had a storage department, and there was a backup team, and then there was a uh, network division, and, and things like that. Now, our, our executive vice president, he took the old organization, actually turned it by, by 90 degrees, uh, and he created what we you know, call so-called uh, service management units, and they are responsible end-to-end, -end, starting from the operating system, up to the application providing the service that this one is running and providing the service to the customer that he or she uh, actually does expect. And as part of the, of the same reorganization, a so-called infrastructure unit wa was created. Uh, so this was already separated out to a certain extent. And their task is not only to provide infrastructure based on the hardware we have in-house, but also to provide services maybe coming from hosting providers or from, from public clouds. So we already kind of created this, this the same layout you have on OpenStack. So you have an infrastructure part, and all they provide is kind of APIs uh, type things to the services uh, on top. Then this is Amadeus specific. Uh, if, you are, if you are in an environment which exists for a while and was quite diverse and with a lot of walls and silos, so we have a huge tools landscape. And of course, we have at least two uh, ways to approach a particular thing to automate it, uh, which is okay, but it really doesn't make your, your OpenStack journey easier. So we pull tools and automation together in one department, one unit, to make sure those things get harmonized and consolidated, because automation is something you do, you do expect as part of OpenStack. It makes the life much more complicated if you want to also introduce automation while you introduce OpenStack. And this is actually what, what happened. So as part of, the, of our OpenStack journey, uh, we did some new things and, and tried to change things which were done in a particular way in the past um, to do it in a newer, better, smarter way. And last but not least, of course, we did create particular DevOps teams, uh, one at the moment, uh, which actually will then run the, uh, the environment for the, for the customer. So now some more details or, or facts, which actually will then... Uh, uh, then I will hand over to, to Eve to provide even more technical details. So at the moment, we have VMware Integrate OpenStack version 1, which is IceHost based. So we are one of the customers who contribute to the large IceHost space uh, installation out there. Uh, but we are looking forward to upgrade to 2.0, which will then Kilo base. Uh, the plan is uh, to do this in, 
in November, so this year, so ideally before we go into the Christmas freeze, uh, everything is done. We are quite settled on the software-defined compute side with vSphere 6. Um, we have also NSX um, used in, in this particular environment, 6.1, but we are, we are also looking forward to upgrade to 6.2 because it will provide some additional features helping for this project, but also for our interfacing project which is related to improve how we provide disaster recovery uh, services. Vsan, we kind of got started, but we are not as advanced as we could be, but th that's okay, uh, despite the fact we had the support from upper management. Uh, we, had o we have only limited resources, and we still have to serve also the traditional uh, business uh, with, th with the same people. So there was no urgent need to tackle this one straight from the beginning, so we kind of have uh, some, I think for the control, for the control brain, I think we use Vsan. Uh, and and if we'll touch on that one later uh, la later on we will expand it and it can wait that's that's okay we have three installations one in central europe in our main data center and actually we have two other installations in the us east coast and then west coast uh, the one in central europe actually was the first one and the lessons learned from that installation we actually have then used also to avoid the same mistakes when we built uh, the us locations um, the uh, central europe one is also used for us internally uh, testing things before we hand them over, also getting used to things, uh, spreading the word, helping the people, educate the people, and also bringing on new projects, uh, uh, services which are running on different infrastructure as a service implementations at the moment, to pull them back to run on an open stack. Yeah, and last but not least, uh, in parallel to those technical things, uh, we are also working with teams like uh, the process management, uh, security office, uh, to get them on board uh, especially to avoid statements like the hypervisor is not secure. And, uh, and if I stick to the security topic, for us it's also something totally new. In the past, all the data were behind the fences inside our walls, but now we have things outside our walls, even outside the continent, which is something totally new for Amadeus. We just require uh, changes, uh, uh, change approaches, uh, different setups, different technologies, which also have to work together with uh, the existing technologies, because also the environments in the US, they are part of our PCI DSS audits, security audits, because we do deal with, with credit card data. Training, I cannot, uh, cannot stop mentioning that one, train the people, spread the word. Um, uh, they need to, need to have a foundation to start, because on, only then they can work further on. And of course, we try to expand, physically expand the installation base we have, especially in our main data center. Yes, and with that one, actually, I'm now shutting down and handing over to Eve to give you some more technical insights. Okay. Uh, a couple of um, closer looks. So before I start in, in, in going into details on what we did there, I want to give you a little one on one on the vSphere drivers. So, because there are differences. Um, what we do is uh, we deploy multiple Nova Compute uh, nodes, uh, basically on VMs, on management VMs, and each of the Nova Compute is actually interfacing to the vSphere API, or to the vCenter API, and is talking to a cluster object there. So Nova Compute for us is not one single hypervisor, it's multiple hypervisors. Because vSphere 6 is up to 64 hypervisors. So it's a large pool of capacity we are interfacing with. Um, Glance is also talking to the vCenter API to upload uh, images uh, onto a vSphere data store. Uh, Cinder creates uh, VMDKs on a vSphere data store uh, to map them to instances. So it's, it's very like uh, you, you always have vCenter in between uh, the uh, OpenStack drivers and, uh, and, and the hydrogen. And the same for, for Neutron. Uh, at Neutron uh, side, we have a plugin that speaks to uh, VMware NSX and builds those virtual networks that span as overlay networks between uh, hypervisors. So we have really uh, a complete virtual networking technology. Okay, so uh, you heard about uh, the requirements to have specific hardware for specific needs, and that drove a requirement, together with an HA requirement, to have, uh, to have specific hardware pools within each rack. So there are multiple racks, and in, in each of those racks we have hypervisor pools for compute, and we have hypervisors for database clusters, uh, actually two different database clusters, and also one for data analytics. 
Now, since the unit is a rack, you, you can't like put multiple of those big boxes in there that, that are supposed to do database stuff and have a lot of uh, local SSD capacity. So it's, it's, it's a single hypervisor, and with the logic that we have uh, at the moment, uh, they are single uh, local compute nodes, and with that, we, we map them to a single availability zone which is not ideal because what we want to be able to do is to move workloads around. Um, and so for, for the next round that we'll have in November, uh, we'll re revisit that and, and likely we'll use a combination of host and DRS groups. Um, in vSphere there are DRS groups, which is basically just a collection of hypervisors within a cluster. Um, and we can address them uh, through either image metadata uh, or through uh, flavors. Uh, in that case, it would be image metadata. So if we take like uh, a database uh, instance, we would tag the image and say, run only on those specific uh, host groups, and then we can we can take that down to a single uh, availability zone uh, and a single cluster. Uh, so those are like the challenges that we had to address uh, to get to this point where we can select specific hardware for specific work specific workload types. And along with that is, is the uh, storage consideration. So there, there was a tendency um, to uh, use a lot, a lot of uh, local disk capacity uh, instead of uh, shared storage. And uh, we, we decided then to go for shared storage more than local capacity because of multiple uh, issues. And those issues are not vSphere specific. Uh, you will encounter them also in a uh, in a KVM-based environment. And the first one is uh, spawning times. So if you have shared storage, you have shared image cache, and so your spawning times will just be much faster. You only spawn once and not every time, not with every hypervisor. Um, also, there is a lot of network traffic that is caused by the spawning process if you don't have shared storage. Um, and now, like in, in the vSphere world, you, you want to be able to move workloads around. DRS does a good job in automatically rescheduling based on load and moving things from one hypervisor to the other, and without shared storage, it's simply not possible. And also for administration uh, purposes, if you want to evacuate a hypervisor, um, shared storage is just helpful. I mean, there is, there is what VMware calls advanced vMotion, where you can also um, move data around between storage, um, but that's just, again, causing network traffic and is slower. So shared storage is a good idea. Today, it's, it's NFS-based. Um, but likely it's going to be vSAN, so what you could compare to uh, to Ceph, so a distributed storage system uh, with, uh, that is using the local disk capacity uh, in the hypervisors. Okay, networking uh, we do with Neutron and NSX. Uh, so the uh, dev environments, the production environments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they all take the same um, network definitions. So. No matter if you look in test dev or in production, you'll find the same subnets, the same routing tiers, etc., etc. So it's a completely uh, virtualized network environment. And the network environment is completely configured uh, within the heat templates that also hold all the information uh, of uh, the application logic and the instances for the application. Uh, from a physical perspective, it's a uh, layer 3 network. Uh, it's an, an ECMP layer 3 fabric. Uh, and, uh, since we're using overlays, we can build layer two networks across those racks um, without any problem. And there is an, an infrastructure utility rack that holds uh, the gateways that go to the outside world, uh, the management connections that go back to the Amadeus data center, and uh, the internet access. And uh, as Udo said, we have a management cluster where the actual OpenStack control plane runs. So in, in VIO, uh, OpenStack is uh, is based on VMs that run on this management cluster, and that management cluster is also cr across racks and is using vSAN uh, with local disk as the data store. Okay, so a couple of other tools that are used. Uh, as I said, all the application environments are defined in heat. Um, those heat templates are all uh, held in an internal Git, and uh, all the images and packages are uh, um, held in architecture. Uh, so with that combination, you basically have your whole definition of what the application, the networks, the whole environment looks like in a centralized, version-controlled um, repository. Right? And, uh, and then you 
you pull from Git and you deploy your application using uh, using heat and, uh, and the images uh, get pulled also and pushed into clients. Um, now, the application comes up or the environment comes up and the first thing that comes up is a puppet master. And that puppet master is actually then uh, like the focal point uh, of configuration management that deploys the, the application, deploys things like the Couchbase cluster uh, and, and like the base application. It also uh, configures a, a local uh, DNS server in, inside of the environment. Um, and the other instances that come up uh, auto registering their DNS records into also this public master that runs locally. Um, what else? Yeah, there is a little uh, interesting thing which is Puppet runs then Ansible to deploy OpenShift. Uh, and actually, uh, a big chunk of the whole application runs in a pass environment that is uh, built on OpenShift, and OpenShift then uses containers uh, to run a lot of the code. So, most of the code is run in containers and like, some things like database and, and other. Uh, more like uh, monolithic functions are running uh, still on VM based. That's basically it for the other tools. And yeah, we are at the end, so uh, I take over again to, to sum up. Um, yeah, on, on high level, what was what made it successful on our side, or what helped us uh, a, a lot, is that we we kept the size small and that we that we uh, stay, stayed focused, uh, that we did select the right application actually. We didn't pick any existing application. We did create new applications to uh, to bring them on the OpenStack uh, journey and selecting the, the right right key people. And if you look just at the infrastructure part, what we have built in our main data center, so we are I think in Global Ops we are more than 900 people, but it's only four or five people who actually did work on on this particular project from an infrastructure point of view. So if, if you have the right people, the subject matter experts, the gurus, the champions, uh, this this helps a lot. And of course there was a um, uh, a good selling of the wine win win situation. So, actually, this particular project, there was uh, interest from both sides, from club operations and from development to go that way. So, there was an, um, a natural joint interest to, to, go so, uh, to go that way and to create, this, uh, to create this new kind of culture, like, like DevOps mentioned before. The point I wanted to make is with the second item, yes, it is technology. Open, uh, OpenStack is technology, but it's really people first. It's up to the people who make the thing successful or, or make it fail, and people on all levels, technical managers, technicians, uh, people managers, or even C-level C -level people. Uh, if you're not starting your own business, if you cannot really start full-time uh, Greenfield, uh, it's okay to fence it out and uh, ignore the prone field uh, at the beginning, but don't forget it. At a certain point, you have to look back, okay, what you do with your existing environment? Will it just die out? Will you migrate it? Will you run it in parallel? Uh, it's okay to uh, le leave it beside uh, at the beginning, but later on, you have, to, you have to look at that one. And this is one of the challenges we have in the midterm future. Uh, once you have successfully uh, uh, gained a lot of experience with this setup that how to expand and actually how to migrate the existing services we have there. And last but not least, yeah, don't do it yourself. Uh, team up. As mentioned, so we have teamed up with, with VMware to do a lot of the infrastructure part. But we have also teamed up, for instance, with, with Red Hat. We are co-developing with Red Hat on the OpenShift side for the orchestration because this is the community way of doing this, of, of influencing things, to make sure that in OpenShift version 3 is the functionality we, we do need. And we have teamed up with other companies um, as well for the, for the same reason. Yes, and with that one, and looking at my, my watch, I think we have still two and a half minutes left. I thanks a lot for your, uh, for your attention, uh, for also for staying awake and staying in the room as much as possible. I think we have time for two or three questions right now, and if there are more questions, uh, we are still around the entire day, today at the party and tomorrow, and we are also, uh, I think, easy to find on the internet if you Google for us. Yeah. So, uh, what kind of performance hits do you see when you slap one stack on top of another? Like the whole vCenter thing on, on top of it, you put OpenStack, and like what kind of performance hits do you see? Because of OpenStack? I think there's, there's none. Yeah. So, we, we have the we had performance hits, but I mean, the only performance hit you might expect is, is uh, maybe uh, API calls, right? Because you have, you have like vCenter and NSX and things like that in, in the middle. Uh, so, uh, and, and it's kind of more concurrent if you if you use uh, like bond over compute per hypervisor. Uh, but honestly, like the complexity of the stack is so big uh, that 
you lose time at so many places that that might not even be the biggest challenge, especially as we're using lean clones also on the vSphere side, which speeds up some things compared to other technologies. So, yes, there are considerations on the API speed and, and scalability, but all in all, it's it's now yeah. Uh, the practical challenges we had were on different layers. Yeah. Do you guys have an upgrade strategy defined from ISOS to Kilo, and what does that look like? Um, okay, you got me? Uh, y yes and no. Um, so the, the person running the project, I didn't have a chance to get briefed before before I got here. Uh, actually, there has to be a schedule. Um, I don't know if Arthur discussed it with, with you uh, in the detail already. Um, so, so first of all, the technical uh, side, there is uh, upgrades in the product, in uh, VMware integrated open stack. Now that's, of course, only of the story, right? There was testing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, going on. But as you see, so there were sites in, in Erding and there are sites in the US. So uh, we will take one site after the other and we'll uh, do our experiences. And we they are actually copies of each other, they are alike. So if we break one, we know we don't do the mistake of the other. Right. And of course, we start with the one in our main data center first because this is only for internal test purposes. So we can, we can break it, yeah. Two or three questions. Um, VIO was only released in March, so how did you make that happen in that short time frame? I think this goes mainly back to really the support from, from the VMware people. Uh, as I said, only a few people uh, did work on that one inside, inside Amadeus, but we got huge support out of VMware. Uh, I have to say kind of expected because we are used to getting this kind of support, but uh, was really a lot of support of dedicated people like Eve, for instance, he really made his hand dirty. Uh, to, to make this happen. I think the cluster was run up and running in, in June already, or July, something like that. So really within a couple of months, we, we made it running. And we couldn't have done this on our own. We wouldn't have had the skill set. And, and even if uh, all the uh, spreading the word, the getting the buy-in of the people, no chance. Now, one part of the reality is also uh, Amadeus was uh, one of our beta systems. So we started in January. This one, yeah. It's a, it's a self-written application uh, providing some services for for hotel customer. Yeah. So this is Amadeus specific. So the majority of our application, or this, our core services, is provided by application we do develop on our own. You you can't buy them. Or you can't. You will find them somewhere else, which sometimes makes it easier because we can easily change the code or adapt the application. But you're also on your own on, on, on that level, yeah. So are there any plans to take some of your bigger ones, like retail engine and so on, to put it on there? Oh yeah, long term, of course, absolutely, we have to. So uh, especially in the in the e-commerce environment, uh, we are thinking about um, to uh, actually there's a pilot just just started. Uh, but we are, there are so many things to, to be considered. Uh, we, we didn't only change the way how we want to provide the infrastructure, we also changed the way how we want to provide uh, the, the platform, the platform there as well. And, and uh, the project will focus on, on that one first and then the other one should, should be easy. Yeah. Long term, yes, everybody should run on, on, on that layer. Um, Midterm, uh, we started with something from the e-commerce area, which is different to the core business to a certain extent. Um, but we, we just got started here. Okay, I guess we're out of time. Oh yes, actually we are over time, but nobody else claiming it here. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>